I remember walking through the halls of Little Rock Central High School one day, and there was a, a young, young guy that we went to high school with, but uh, he must have skipped several grades because he was sm- much, a lot smaller than everybody else, and plus he was just a little guy to begin with, and people used to kind of make fun of him and mess with him at Central, and he had his arms full of books one day, and he was coming, I can, I can see it today, he was coming down the steps, um, the stairway there at Central, and, and I, was, I had just started to walk up. When I, when I saw some guys uh, ahead of me, they pushed him against the wall with all his books, and he fell down, and his books went everywhere, and everybody laughed. And, and I can remember I was walking up the steps. I watched all that happen, and I just walked right on by. I still remember. In fact, most of you remember moments like that. You don't, you don't really forget them. I had, a, I had a guy I grew up with, one of my, one of my best friends. We, we fished together. We rode three-wheelers together back in that day. Um, we, we hunted together. We, we, we went to school together. We played football together. Uh, just one of, my, one of my great friends. And uh, we did a lot of stuff together. One thing we didn't do together is we didn't go to church together. He didn't go to church at all, and I never invited him because I had friends at church, and I had a girlfriend at church, and you know, you kind of, you don't want somebody else tagging along and, and kind of messing up with that time with your other friends and my girlfriend, and I didn't really want, you know, somebody else being there to kind of mess up that time, and uh, never invited him, and I'll never forget that I never invited him. You don't forget, and I bet that all of us have regrets. We could sit around and share it, and most of us, there are things that we remember that we wish we didn't remember, but we do remember. And the truth is, is we can't forget, because we have regrets about things we said, or things we didn't say, or things we did, or things we didn't do, or, or some stupid thing that we did that had some tragic consequence. We all have regrets. And the truth is, as we come towards Thanksgiving this week, and we're all supposed to be thankful and all that kind of stuff, I mean, the truth is that some of us our thankfulness and our joy is somewhat diminished by the memories of our regrets. And, and what I want us to look at today is, is, does the Scripture say something that could free us from the joy robber of our regrets? And, and I think it does. In fact, you may say, you know, Jeff, your regrets don't match up to mine at all. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, that's really great, your things. But listen, you don't understand what I've done or where I've been, and maybe that's true. Maybe my regrets are silly compared to yours, and they don't match up at all. But I'll tell you somebody who can match up regrets with you, and that's Paul. Paul can match up with you. Whatever you've done, I'm willing to put his life beside yours and say he messed up just as big as you did. And, and I want to look at his story today because his story tells us about how God can use our regrets and that we can find joy even in the memory of our regrets. All right? Now, you guys remember Paul. Paul was, uh, uh, his name was Saul before he was Paul. He was Saul and uh, his life changed and all that kind of stuff. But I want to talk about before his life changed. The first time we meet Paul is in Acts chapter 7. And at this time, he's called Saul. And so I'm going to read you a bit from the story here where where it shows up. It's at the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was a young man. What we know about Stephen, he was a young man who was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was preaching to this crowd of people about who Jesus was. And he was reminding them of their history, how they had persecuted all the people that God sent to speak to them, that they had always persecuted the prophets. And he told them they had done the same thing to Jesus. And the crowd is getting angrier and angrier, but Stephen refuses to back down. And so then we come to this passage right here, beginning in verse 57. Uh, the crowd's angry. Stephen's looked up and said he sees, the, he sees Jesus seated at the right hand of God. And, and this is what happens beginning in verse 57. At this they covered their ears, the crowd, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They were, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Saul was there giving approval to his death. In fact, the scripture tells us that the men came and laid their cloaks at the feet of Saul. And and many of our biblical scholars simply believe that that means that Saul was the one that was in charge at this moment. They all came and they laid their their cloaks at the feet. And and Saul wasn't the one throwing the stones, but he was the one in charge supervising it all. 
from the back, approving of the stoning of this young man named Stephen, who was just a young guy who was full of the Holy Spirit, speaking the truth, trying to get people to hear about the truth of Jesus Christ. That's who he was. And Paul, at Saul at this moment, Paul was right there, right there, approving of it all. Now, when his life was changed, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and, 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 and Paul's life was changed, it was changed so much that he changed his name. He went from being called Saul to being called Paul just to recognize the drastic change that had occurred in his life. Paul was reborn. He was transformed. He was given a whole new life. But I want to tell you something. That whole new life that Jesus gave him, it didn't take the memories away. It didn't take the memories away. And how many nights do you think it was that, that Paul sat around remembering Stephen? And that's kind of hard to get away from. I mean, if I can remember a, a little guy who was pushed down in the hall at school and didn't stop to help him, I mean, how many times do you think that, that Paul remembered as he laid down to go to sleep at night, how many times he thought about Stephen there as they were stoning him, looking up and saying, God, forgive them for they don't know what they were doing. His life was changed, but when his life was changed by Christ, his memories weren't erased. And he still had all those memories of all the things that he had done that haunted him. They were still there. And when you read the scriptures, you see Paul mentioning this. They, they didn't. You see him talking about it. He remembered his life. He remembered all the things that he had done. Those regrets were there. But listen, here's also what we get when we read the scripture. We see that Paul remembered, but that these regrets were used in a powerful way in his life for a positive good. They were used in a powerful way for positive in his life. You say, well, how can that be? I mean, how can, how can those memories, that, those hurtful memories that cause me so much shame and guilt and condemnation, every time I remember those things, I just, man, I'm flooded with those same old things. Are you telling me that, that those feelings of shame and guilt and condemnation can give away to freedom and joy and peace in the memory of my regrets? And I'm saying, yeah, God can do that too. He's that amazing. And when we read Paul's story, that's exactly what we see happening. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, I want just to read you. Paul's writing to a younger pastor, and this guy named Timothy. And, and in this scripture here, we begin to see, I believe, the secret to transforming uh, our regrets from producing guilt and shame uh, to producing joy and peace. Right here, beginning in verse 12 of 1 Timothy. It says this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. You hear the memory? You hear the regrets? Of whom I am the worst. But, but listen what else Paul is saying there. Paul is saying, listen, man, listen. Listen about how amazing God is. Listen, listen how trustworthy Christ is. Listen how forgiving God is. Listen how wide the mercy of God is. Man, when Paul remembered his regrets and he looked what God had done, it caused Paul to look up and say, God, you're amazing. Man, you're just too much. And he's writing to Timothy and he's saying, listen, man, all that I've been through, I've discovered how awesome this God is. My regrets have caused me to just lift up praise to God. And, and he's trying to say, listen, remember that regrets and failures from the past, they don't disqualify you from the love of God. They don't disqualify you from service. They don't disqualify you from ministry. Rather, in fact, they do just the opposite. Listen to what he said there in verse 15 again. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. I mean, man, you've got, you got to hold on to this. If you want to experience the life that Jesus wants to give you, you can't gloss over this. It's essential. This deserves full acceptance right here. Here's, and this is one of the early creeds of the church. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Listen, if you're not messed up, you don't need Jesus. Hey, if you got it all together and you've got a lily white past and you've never done anything horrible and you never walked by anybody in the hall that was being pushed down by bullies, if that's never happened to you, then you don't need Jesus. You've got it all figured out. It's only those of us who have regrets. It's only those of us who look back on our life and say, man, I've really messed up. 
Man, I don't want to be that person. I know left to my own devices that following my own heart and, and the devices of my own mind, I know that I'm going to do the same thing again. And man, I need some help. And Paul is saying, listen, my regrets pushed me into the arms of my Savior. They helped me recognize my need for help. They helped me recognize who I was, that I'm a sinner. And when I look back and remember who I was and all the things I did, listen, those things I recognize now, what the devil intended for evil, God has used for good, those things now have pushed me into the arms of Jesus. And isn't God amazing? I mean, isn't he something? And that's what Paul is saying. Isn't God amazing how God works in this? Because of his regrets, Paul loved Christ all the more. Because of his failures, Paul realized that, that he was qualified for acceptance because Jesus said he came to save sinners. If you're not a sinner, you don't need Jesus. And so Paul says, listen, man, I need him most of all. And I've discovered his grace is so sufficient to meet my every need because I remember who I was. And I remember where I've been. Listen, that, now, now maybe I'm getting psychological now and all that kind of stuff, but I, but I don't see how you can help it at this point. When you look at Paul's life, you see something else that was going on. Paul had a passion for people that were far from God. When, when the apostles were, were dividing up the ministry, most of the apostles were concentrating on the Jewish people. And while the Jewish people had much to learn about being followers of, of Jesus, listen, they had had the Word of God for a long time. They, they had the law. They, they knew a way to live. They had a moral compass already. And, and the apostles, most of them said, you know, we're going to go to the Jews, but who does Paul say I'm going to go to? Paul says, man, you can have them. I'm going to go to those people that don't know anything yet. Paul says, I'm going to go to those who are farthest from God. That's who I want to go to. Paul says, that's my ministry to these people who are far from God and lost. He says, that's where my heart is. And I can't help but thinking that that came from the fact that Paul uh, had experienced that himself. He realized how far he had been from God. Far he'd been from God. And how God had come so far for him. And so when, when, the, when it came ta time to divvy up the jobs, Paul said, you know what? God's calling me to those people. Because I can, I can, I can relate to that. Because that's where I was. And God came to me. Not only did his regrets cause him to praise God and push him into the arms of Jesus, his regrets gave him a passion and an empathy and a sympathy for people who were lost. Listen, we see the opposite of this uh, in a story of the disciples. They had a... Uh, They'd been following Jesus around, and they were all hyped up on Jesus. They thought he was the best thing since sliced bread ever. And, uh, and they're really, I mean, all these miracles have been happening and stuff, and so they're all excited. And, and uh, listen to what happens uh, in this story right here in Luke chapter 9, beginning of verse 51. It says, As the time approached for, for him, that's Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? You hear what they say? Man, who are these people to reject you, Jesus? Who are these people to turn you down? Let's call down fire from heaven and destroy them. I mean, that's what we ought to do. And, and the scripture says that Jesus turned and rebuked them. I wish they told us what he said, but they did. It's kind of like a private conversation. This is not for you guys. This is just for them conversation it says that jesus rebuked them they wanted to call down fire from who are these people to reject jesus let's destroy them all you know what we don't see much of that after the death and resurrection of jesus we don't really see the disciples calling down fire from heaven to destroy everybody do we and, and i wonder if if that experience of those disciples abandoning jesus of the, the, the disciples uh, turning against Jesus in his hour of need, I wonder if the memory of, uh, of that regret for them called them to hesitate in the future before they called fire down on everybody else. I mean, you think that had something to do with, with how they began to live after that? I've got to think so. And, you know, and, I, and, and not in our church because we're great, but in some churches, the good church folk want to call fire down on people. I mean, it's this group of people is destroying America, and fire needs to fall down on them. And this group's destroying the church, and fire needs to, God needs to just, just deal with them and just wipe everybody out. I, mean, I don't know about that. You know? I mean, I've done some bad things too, and so have you. And that recognition, that memory of our regret 
can be used by God to give us compassion and sympathy for those who are far from God or just people who have just messed up and done something dumb in their life. It can give us compassion and sympathy for them. And that's what happened in Paul's life. It's his regrets gave him a passion for God and gave him a, a compassion for those who were far from God. He goes on in verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 1 to say this. He says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy. Listen, he says, it, because he was the worst of sinners, that's what he's talking about, because I was the worst of sinners, but for that very reason, I was shown, shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now, do you hear what that's saying? It says, it says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy because of my regrets, because of my past, because of my failures, because I had been a persecutor of Christians, because I had been there when, when Stephen was stoned. Because of that reason, God now called me, and God uses my regret to reach somebody else. It's those stories now. It, it's what happened in my life. God now wants to use that to reach other people who are far from him. God redeemed his regrets. That's the biblical word. God redeemed his regrets. What the devil intended for evil, God took back. And now God uses those moments in his life when he messed up in the greatest way. God uses those moments in his life now to reach other people. It's because Paul can say I'm the worst of sinners. It's because he can say, listen, you think you messed up. I was there when they killed Stephen. Let me tell you my story. Because of that, what God had done in his life, now he was able to reach so many other people. God redeemed his regret. He turned it around on Satan and used it for good to expand his kingdom. I, I, I believe that's one of the secrets to finding joy even in your regret. Is to realize that God can redeem them. Because the evil one wants to tell you something different. The evil one wants to tell you to hide your regret. The evil one wants to tell you that if people knew who you were or what you had done, that they would treat you differently. The evil one wants you to say, listen, make sure nobody ever finds out about that. Uh, you, you, you just keep it hidden. Just don't ever tell anybody. Because he knows that hidden regrets, the fruit of hidden regrets is not peace and joy. The fruit of hidden regrets is condemnation and guilt and shame. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've hidden it from other people and you've tried to hide it from yourself. You think, if I don't talk about it, if I don't acknowledge it, if I don't remember it, it'll go away. And you know what? Right now, you know that it doesn't go away, does it? Just trying to act like it never happened doesn't make it go away. It doesn't take away the memories. It doesn't redeem your regrets, and yet that's what you've been trying to do for so many years. Just pretend it never happened. I'm not going to think about it, but the truth is, is that you do think about it sometimes. And when you do think about it, what it brings is guilt and condemnation and shame. And none of those are what God wants for your life. And it's possible that your greatest regret is what God wants to use to reach somebody else who's far from Him and to bring them close. That if you are willing to expose some of your deepest regrets and, and to share that, that God might use that to reach somebody else. And, and that God might use what you've been through to bring somebody else joy and peace and freedom. And, and just think what would happen to you when when God would use your regrets to bring somebody else joy and peace and freedom, what happens to you? I want to tell you something. You begin to experience some of the same. You begin to think, man, this thing that's caused me so much guilt and shame and so much condemnation, now I see God using it. God has taken it back from the evil one, and now I'm experiencing joy and peace and freedom because God's using some of my stuff, some of my junk, to reach somebody else. Somebody say amen. That's good stuff, I'm telling you. All right? Isn't God amazing? I mean, that's what God does. Last week, we said if you want to know joy, uh, there's going to be a lot of times in life when, 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 you're, when circumstances don't give you joy, you're going to have to just trust God, even when the circumstances of life don't look like it. And today, I want to tell you this. If you want to experience joy in your regret, you have to give them to Him. 
You have to give them to him. You got to say, God, I, whatever you want to do with this, I just want to get it. You can use anything. Use the cross, which was a sign of shame and humiliation, the worst punishment that the Romans could hand out. You've now used the cross to become something beautiful that stands for a depth of love we could have never known outside of that. So, God, what I want to do today is I want to give you my regrets. And here's how we're going to do this. Uh, at the end of every row is, is a cup with some pencils and some pieces of paper in it. It's on, the, it's on, the, on, on this side, on the end of every row. I'm going to take a pencil and a piece of paper and pass that down. On your, uh, on your tables are some pieces of paper uh, as well. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to take a, a pencil and a piece of paper, and I want you to write on that. You've got to use my paper. Don't use your paper. Don't tear off the bulletin. Uh, don't do that. You've got to use my little pieces of paper I've given you right here. They're, they're special pieces of paper. Little strips like this. Mine's kind of torn. I want to encourage you to get one of these little strips of piece of paper right here. And I want you to write one regret on there. Maybe you want to write two. Uh, nobody's going to see this. Nobody's going to read it. Uh, we're just going to put this on the cross today. We're going to give this to God. All right? So I want you to write, I just want you to write one regret that you have. I know you can think of just one. If you got two, you might put them on there. But really, I want this to symbolize for you your willingness to simply give this to God. And say, God, I'm going to put this on the cross. And I want you, when you have your regret written down, I want to invite you to just come up here and put it on one of these nails on the cross. It can touch somebody else's. It can be on top of theirs. Just I want to invite you, when you're ready, uh, as we're singing here, and, and, and just come up here, get yours written down, come up here and place it on the cross. All right? Okay? As you're ready, uh, come. Bring yours up here and put it on the cross. Here's the amazing thing about God. God is king, and God is victor. And the nev devil never wins. Even in our regrets, God can redeem our regrets when we trust him. And that's the good news of Jesus. Even in our regrets, our regrets themselves will become instruments for the kingdom of God if we simply trust him.
God wins. Give it to him. Give it to him. And listen, we don't just do this once. I don't think that Paul gave his memory of Stephen just once. I think he gave it to him day after day. I think every time that memory came up, he said, God, this is yours, God. Hey, I, I remember again, you use this, God. You, you Every day, we're going to give it to the cross. Every day, we're going to lay it there. God, use this. Give it to him. And even our regrets are going to bring us joy. This is the kind of God we serve. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for your great love and mercy. God, we thank you for your power that you can redeem even our greatest regrets, that those things that have caused us guilt and shame and condemnation can be taken away. Lord, you will take away that and replace it with freedom and peace and joy as we give it to you. So, Lord, we trust you. Lord, we're not going to listen to the evil one anymore who's convinced us that we have to be silent, that we have to hide. Lord, we, we, we are confident that you can take all of our past and use it for the good of your kingdom. And so we're just going to give it to you, Lord. Uh, take it. And use it for what you will, for the good of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.